Hello, I'm thrilled to be here and join NOMA staff in welcoming you to the exhibition Buddha and Shiva, Lotus and Dragon, masterworks from the Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III collection at Asia Society. My thanks to Susan Taylor and Lisa Rotondo McCord for making the exhibition possible at NOMA and inviting me to speak. John D. Rockefeller III and his wife and partner in collecting, Blanchette Hooker Rockefeller, had a deep reverence for Asian cultures. Where did that feeling come from? Why did they decide to build a collection of Asian art? And how do this, the works in this exhibition evoke the respect and reverence the Rockefellers wanted to share with the American people? John D. Rockefeller III and his wife and partner in collecting, Blanchette Hooker Rockefeller, held a deep reverence for Asian cultures. In 1974, JDR III announced his plan to gift the Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller the third collection of Asian art to Asia Society in New York, an organization he had founded in 1956. He stated, my own experience tells me that anyone who becomes acquainted with the arts and cultures of Asia acquires a greatly augmented sense of appreciation and respect for its peoples. We hope that the collection integrated into Asia society's programs can instill in American uh, relations, Asian American relations, and at an added sense of importance and opportunity. J.D. Art III unexpectedly died in 1978, but his wife and partner, Blanchette Hooker Rockefeller, saw the realization of their visit, vision in a new Asia Society building with beautiful galleries for display of their collection of Asian art, the one that now stands at Park Avenue and 70th Street in New York. And you can see uh, Blanchette at the groundbreaking ceremony for the building on the left and the Asia Society building uh, today. Who were JDR III and Blanchette Hooker Rockefeller? J.D.R. III was a son of wealthy philanthropists and art collectors. His father, John D. Rockefeller Jr., was a son of, of the founder of the Standard Oil Company. J. Jr. famously wrote to his father in 1915, requesting a loan of $1 million to buy Ming and Qing Dynasty Chinese porcelains from the J.P. Morgan's collection. And those uh, porcelains were his, his great love and obsession. J.D.R. III's mother, Abby, was the fourth child of Abby Pierce Chapman and Nelson Wilmarth Aldrich. Her father served in the Rhode Island State House of Representatives and as a U.S. Senator. Abby paid an integral role in the realization of the founding of the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, and she gave works of art to MoMA, as well as other museums, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Cloisters, and the Rhode Island School of Design. Now imagine J.D.R. III's childhood. Um, his homes were rich with the architecture and art and even some of the smells of Asia. Here on the screen, you can see uh, the Meiji period tea house that uh, formerly stood in uh, the family home in Canticle Hills. Um, here it is in the 1920s. And on the right hand side is um, one of the entryways into the uh, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller uh, Garden in Mount Desert Island, Maine, which is where the family summered. Uh, they had this garden uh, designed and this section here you can see has a wall that is actually covered with uh, those, um, those uh, um, imperial yellow tiles from um, the Forbidden City in Beijing. And of course, the home was filled, all their homes were filled with um, Kangxi porcelains uh, and other uh, Qing and Ming porcelains from uh, Junior's collection. And you can see a picture here of one of the pieces that's now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a picture of Abby with her son, David, um, with porcelains uh, around them. And uh, David is even sitting on, on a, a porcelain stool. <clears throat> um, Abby 
um, had completely different tastes. And she was very interested in religious art from the East and then had a number of Buddha rooms uh, in the family homes, which were her own, um, her own spaces. And, um, but that she also shared with the family. Uh, and here is an image on the right of one of them and also an image from her collection that she gave to the Metropolitan Museum of Art on the left-hand side. She purchased through dealers of Asian art like Yamanaka Sadajiro, uh, but her intrepid sister, Lucy Aldrich, also helped her a great deal with her collecting. Lucy traveled to Asia several times and when abroad, she would buy Japanese textiles, prints, and other works for her sister. In 1923, when JDR III was in his late teens, Lucy Aldrich was traveling in China on a train that was stopped by armed bandits, and she was captured and held for two days before her release. This photo shows her in India with JDR's sister Babs um, three years earlier before, prior to that kidnapping. Of course, uh, Lucy was perfectly fine after the kid kidnapping. She was a strong woman. <clears throat> Blanchette Hooker Rockefeller was born as Blanchette Ferry Hooker in New York City. She was the daughter of affluent people, Blanchette Ferry and Elon Huntington Hooker. Her mother's family owned the Ferry Moore Seed Company in Detroit, and her father was president of the Hooker Electrochemical Company. She developed into a woman who believed deeply in service and was also a great collector and generous donor of modern art. Like her mother-in-law, she was very involved with MoMA. Beginning in 1953, she also served on the New York State Council of the Arts, the National Council of Humanities, and, the, and was chairman of the, chair, uh, of the Asian Arts Council. JDR III graduated from Princeton and Blanchette Prue Vassar, and the couple married in 1932. Now, what, but why did, why did they collect Asian art? Uh, as we've seen, JDR III's upbringing gave him a familiarity with Asian art, but it was his own travels and experiences in Asia and with Asians that informed his deci decisions to seriously collect Asian art himself. After graduating from college in 1929, he left for a trip around the world. Between July and December of that year, he made his first trip to Asia. He kept a daily diary throughout his adult life, and it captures his fascination what, with what he encountered on that trip. And yet, he does not, he, he does not express any uh, personal interest in collecting in his diaries at that time. In less than a decade, the world was at war. And in 1938, JDR III joined the Navy as a Lieutenant com Commander in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. It was only after his release from active duty in 1945 that JDR III once again found himself in East Asia. His role was as cultural consultant to John Foster Dulles, who, uh, who dates from uh, 1888 to 1959, um, who uh, served as a special representative for Harry S. Truman during the Japanese peace treaty negotiations. JDR III then became part of an uh, interagency task force dedicated to formulating U.S. post-war policy for Japan. And it was during this period that he and Blanchette formed a deeper knowledge of Japan and its ancient, ancient past. Japan became a second home to the couple. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, it was also in the late 1940s that JDR III and Blanchette began to wade into the world of collecting. Asian art um, is mentioned in his diaries and correspondence, and uh, doc and is uh, and there there is documentation of the reception of gifts of Asian art, and they certainly purchased works of art from time to time while traveling. With uh, with his interest in cultural affairs, JDR the third put his deep connections and diplomatic skill to use as a proponent of the first major exhibition of Japanese art to travel from Japan to the United States, the 1953 International Loan Exhibition, Art Treasures from Japan. The show, organized under the auspices of the Commission for the Protection of Cultural Properties, 
toured to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Seattle Art Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. 420,000 viewers attended the exhibition in the United States. For JDR III, the power of cultural diplomacy was proved. Americans were learning to see beyond the context of the horrors of World War II when they thought about the Japanese people and Japanese culture. This was a watershed moment for the Rockefellers. In the 1950s, JDR III and Blanchett became serious collectors of Asian antiquities, seeking out expert advice about works they had acquired or were considering for their collection. They were part of a new generation of collectors, some of whom had lived and worked in China, in Asia during and after the war. Throughout the 50s and 60s, JDR III, usually accompanied by Blanchette and sometimes by the couple's children, Jay, Hope, Sandra, and Elida, made nearly annual trips to Asia, at first with what JDR III described as, quote, a more general sightseeing or general information of, uh, contact approach. Their travels took them through 20 East Asian, South Asian, and Southeast Asian countries. Their itinerary included visits to archeological sites, architectural tre treasures, museums, and private collections. In this photograph, we see the couple with their son, Jay, who was to become Senator Rockefeller, partaking in the practice of Japanese tea in the home of the Japanese prime minister during one of their visits to Japan. Japan remained their most regular stop into the 1970s. It had become not only a place with close personal ties, it was also the home base of art dealers they knew well and trusted. And during these decades, the time spent with Japanese collectors whose private museums, which sometimes included extensive teaware displays, um, was critical to the formation of the Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III collection of Asian art. The Rockefellers ramped up their collecting practice for Asian art to an even higher level when in 1963, they hired the specialist Sherman E. Lee to be their advisor. Even prior to employing Lee, he had helped steer the Rockefellers in the right direction, introducing them to major dealers and informing them of important pieces that were available and helping them hone a collecting philosophy. Lee is deservedly credited with assisting the couple, couple to ultimately assemble one of the most spectacular private collections of Asian art in the United States. Um, together, they uh, used a system of ranking uh, collection objects uh, from A to D. And as they worked together, they honed the collection to make it stronger and stronger. A little bit about Lee now. Like JDR III, he had also held a position in post-war Japan, where he remained from 1946 to 1948. Lee had the good fortune to have been sent to work for the Arts Monuments Department of the Supreme Commander Allied Forces in the Pacific. In this capacity, he helped to inventory major Japanese art collections throughout the country. Lee had, had formed relationships in Japan with a number of influential Japanese art historians, and these experiences refined the formal art historical and connoisseurship skills he had gained in the United States up to that point. <clears throat> the results of his education in, in these seminal years for his career are evident in the first edition of his uh, 1964, A History of Far Eastern Art. And of course, for example, in the collections of the Seattle Museum uh, Seattle Art Museum, where he served as assistant director and curator of Asian art from 1948 to 52, and the Cleveland Museum of Art, where he served as curator beginning in 1952, and then director from 1958 to 1983. How could Lee be director at Cleveland Museum with a commitment to the Asian collections there and also be an advisor to the Rockefellers? Well, Lee and JDR III formed an agreement that they would flip a coin to see who would get a piece that both saw and wanted at the same time. Fortunately, <clears throat> the, toy, the, the coin toss was not often necessary. And sometimes, like in the case of this bronze in the form of a ritual food vessel called a guay, there were two of the 
cost of the same thing that came up for auction at the same time. <clears throat> um, so today, um, one of these pieces, the one you see on the screen here and also uh, in the exhibition um, is at Asia Society. And the other uh, is in the collection of the Cleveland Museum of Art. Both are believed to have been unearthed at, at Linzu, the capital of the state of Qi from the middle of the ninth century to the first quarter of the third century BCE. During the Zhou period, bronzes like this way were items of wealth and power. The wave-like patterns cover the body, base, and lid. The impressive crest at the top of the lid becomes a stand for the bowl-shaped lid when it is removed. The dragon handles are excellent examples of the sculptural decorative qualities found in fabulous Eastern Zhou period bronze vessels. This lovely porcelain pillow is of a type called arita ware. Chairman Lee was especially fond of arita ware. And actually the first time he went to Japan, which was on a naval ship in 1945, he rushed off to visit the arita kilns when his ship docked at a nearby port. Arita, located in Saga Prefecture, he's in province on the southern Japanese island of Kyushu, established, established itself as the most important center for porcelain production in the world during the 17th century, when China withdrew from its active role in international porcelain exports. The drum-shaped pillow is of a type of porcelain manufactured for Japanese use. It's decorated in overglazed enamels with a restrained pattern of white cherry blossoms against bold red color typical of the so-called Imari style. Neck pillows like this one were helpful for those who wanted to maintain their elaborate ha hairstyles while resting and sleeping. Other Arita wares in the collection of Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III include uh, this uh, stately bowl. Arita potters at the Kaikemon workshop, one of several leading manufacturers in northern Kyushu, uh, catering to international demands for porcelain, produced this impressive vessel. It was formerly in the collection of Augustus the Strong, the elector of Saxony and king of Poland, who reigned from 1694 to 1733. He played an instrumental role in setting up the Meissen factory outside of Dresden that produced the first porcelain in Europe. The custom-made gilt bronze mounts probably manufactured in Germany, attest to how highly Asian porcelain was treasured by Augustus the Strong and Westerners in general at this time. And you can see it's really um, uh, painted uh, with beautiful detail inside of the bowl and also with uh, floral sprays on the exterior. This plate is of a type called Nabashima ware. The term refers to plates, bowls, and dishes made from porcelain at the Arita kilns uh, uh, <clears throat> that were operated directly by the Nabashima clan, the ruler of the Saga domain between the, the 1640s and 1871. Both decorative and functional, this refined Japanese porcelain was created exclusively for the shogunal families, feudal lords, and nobility. Nabashima ware was uh, uniquely um, Japanese in design. And as we see on this example, they often feature motifs found in nature and in Japanese textiles. And these are presented in asymmetrical compositions, as you see here. In this case, the combination of blossoming cherry trees and curtains may refer to the creation of a private picnic space with curtains for enjoying food in natural surroundings. The underglazed blue, iron brown, and green glazes each melt at different temperatures and therefore require separate firings. There are also some really wonderful Japanese tea wares in the Rockefeller collection. This square dish, possibly used for serving grilled fish, is an example of Mino ware. This ware is one of several kinds of ceramic used for serving food in association with the practice of Japanese tea, known as chanoyu. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, a type of ware called oribe evolved at the Mino kilns in Gifu prefecture. 
One style of tea practice developed by Furuta Oribe, who lived from 1544 to 1615, favored an expressive and individualistic style of tea. This square dish is associated with Furuta Oribe and his aesthetic um, because of the distorted shape and bold decorations that we see here, um, uh, which were very much in tandem with the tea master's shape. Uh, uh, were very much in tandem with the tea master's taste. Note the solid and patterned circle, vertical lines, and those abstract bamboo shoots that you see there pointing at us. Um, ivory slip and iron brown pigment under a transparent glaze, as well as bright copper green glaze, help to en enliven uh, this, this pattern. This elegant tea leaf storage jar is one of the objects in the Rockefeller collection that JDR III had to go to extra lengths to purchase. The Rockefellers acquired the piece from a Japanese dealer in 1973, but first the exportation of the piece required special permission from the, the Japanese Agency for Cultural Affairs because, because it had been accessioned as an important cultural property, which meant it was designated as a work not to be exported from Japan. However, JDR III was able to convince the agency of the importance for the American public to have access to a first-class Japanese ceramic here in America. And ultimately, the export papers were granted. The jar is a star among those created by the Kyoto potter, Nonamura Ninse, who was active from 1646 to 77. He was closely associated with a renowned tea master, Kawamori Sowa, who lived from 1585 to 1656. You can see how much the design of this jar differs from the Oriverware dish we just looked at. And in fact, Ninse's sophisticated ceramics express perfectly a different kind of tea aesthetic, one of refined beauty or kire that Kawamori Sowa strived to include in his tea ceremonies. The minor birds stand on the ground, fly, and fight in the air. <clears throat> in addition to the overglazed enamels, Ninsa used silver, now tarnished, to add glimmer to the bird wings. A spot of gold shivers on part of the landscape, on the part of the landscape next to the tail of the bird on the ground, as you see here. And you can see how uh, dynamic um, the um, imagery is on this as you go around the, the jar. Uh, the imagery on the jar. Ogata Kenzan, the maker of this bowl, was mentored by Nonamura Ninse. Like Ninse, Ogata Kenzan worked in Kyoto. Both Nonamura Ninse and Kenzan were the first Japanese potters to sign their work. And here you can see Kenzan's signature on the bottom of the piece. The, potters, the potter used stylized decorative patterns of green bamboo, bands of white mist, and flying geese in gold to embellish the bowl. Now, let's look at a few Chinese works in the Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III collection. The, the, uh, the Chinese communist leaders had put a stop to trade of Chinese artworks in 1949, and then the American government also blocked the import of goods of Chinese origins, including art, as an economic measure during the Korean War from 1950 to 53. So JDR III and Blanchett Hooker Rockefeller mainly focused on collecting works that were in European and US collections prior, prior to these embargoes. These are two of the works in the exhibition they were able to acquire that date to the Tang period, which is celebrated as the great, the great age of cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism in China. Trade across land routes as well as the sea were active and China's capitals and trade cities were bustling with multi-ethnic and religious short-term and long-term residents. Both of these works attest to that cosmopolitanism. The court lady on the right is a clay sculpture made to accompany the deceased in a tomb. She is dressed in a style of the late seventh century with a high-waisted dress. The figure likely would have been part of a group of musical uh, entertainers. She, 
is seated, captured holding, holding her symbols in the midst of her performance. Her clothes are decorated with butterscotch and cream colors that are so frequently found in so-called sansai or three color wear ceramic, uh, ceramics. The generous use of cobalt blue, uh, as you see in the glaze, uh, identifies the work as particularly luxurious and from a tomb of a member of the elite. The blue could only result from cobalt that at this time was imported from Iran and thus was uh, incredibly ex ex expensive to produce. And uh, this is uh, also uh, for the period, a, a especially a dynamic and, and lively figure. On the left-hand side um, is a silver stem cup that also points to the flourishing mercantile and cultural exchange between China and Central Asian and Sasanian period Iran. Such silver works are relatively rare. Sherman Lee had the good fortune to study similar works when he was in Japan serving art, surveying art from the Imperial Storehouse as part of, part of his job with the Arts and Monuments Department of the Supreme uh, Commander Allied Forces in the Pacific. Such wares were valuable goods used in diplomatic exchange, high level entertaining by wealthy elites, and um, sometimes um, were uh, important donations to Buddhist temples. You can see that intricate designs of flowers and birds cover the exterior of this elegant stem cup. The Song Dynasty is considered one of the high points of ceramic production in China. And this spectacular Song bottle is of a kind of ware called Suzhou, after one of the areas that these high fired ceramics were created in the prefecture in Hebei province. The peony flowers the, and leaves appear in black and white <clears throat> um, and in, in black against white, in fact. And this is the most common sujo wear color palette. The decoration is the result of the sgraffito technique. First, the body of the vessel, which is a light gray, was covered with a white slip. And then the white was coated with a black slip. A potter then incised and shaved the pattern into the black slip, exposing areas of the white slip underneath. A white, whitish transparent glaze covers uh, the beautiful design. <clears throat> and this um, is one of, uh, one of the most uh, spectacular uh, pieces of Sujo Ware extant uh, today. The dark color of the oil spot glaze coating this northern Song uh, period brush washer comes from the iron in the glaze. The silvery speckles are a result of excess iron rising to the surface while the, the glaze was boiling in the kiln. Ceramics from the Jian kilns in southeast China produced high fired, iron rich glaze ceramics for this effect. And it's possible that their popularity inspired northern potters to create similar wares. In the north, the potters potters added iron rich slip beneath the glaze, which provided the more secure oil spots outcome that you see here on this bowl. And this is a substantial uh, a bowl and just uh, really spectacular in, with its, in its patterning. This impressive mid 14th century platter found its way to the Indian Mughal court by the mid 17th century. A Persian inscription engraved on the outside of the foot ring cites the name of the emperor, Shah Jahan, who reigned from 1627 to 58. Um, and there's a date corresponding to 1652 or 1653 in the Western calendar in the inscription as well. And you can see that uh, inscription enlarged here on your left. Shah Jahan was a great patron of the arts and, and, and great collector. And the inscription suggests that he took special pride in owning this piece of Chinese blue and white porcelain. The Yuan period when the vessel was produced was an important one for the development of porcelain, for porcelain decorated with cobalt blue under a, a clear glaze. China had been active in maritime trade for centuries, but a new spike in ceramics export to the Middle East occurred during the Yuan period and into the early Ming dynasty 
the size of this pattern, uh, this, the size of this platter, suggests that it was created for an overseas market that dined off large communal plates. Messages of good fortune and blessings are conveyed by the mythical Chinese chilean, the, uh, the unicorn-like creature at the center, surrounded by bamboo, morning glories, plantains, and melons in uh, just a, 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 a lovely and um, spirited painted pattern. Chinese dragons are powerful but benign creatures that have long been associated with the emperor in China. These two, um, there's a dragon on each side of the vessel, um, stretch powerfully against a backdrop of floating scrolling vines of lotus. The presence of the dragons on this flask is significant because we know that during the Ming period, objects with three or four clawed dragons functioned at court both as gifts from emperor, from the emperor to his attendants and to foreign rulers and dignitaries. And as you can see, this is a three clawed dragon, both are three clawed dragons. The flask has all the hallmarks of 14th and 15th century underglazed blue and white porcelains, almost black spots where the cobalt has, quote, heaped and gathered, unquote, and a slightly blue tinted clear glaze that when carefully looked at shows the subtle pockmarked orange peel quality that is the result of the marks left by tiny bubbles bursting during the firing process at high temperature are all uh, um, important elements of this magnificent and very large piece. Among the most prized <clears throat> Chenghua era porcelains are delicate, small, thinly potted, potted wine cups like this one on the right, decorated with a combination of underglazed cobalt blue enamels. This one has a pattern of dragons in floral medallions and floating flowers. The pattern has been painted not only in underglazed cobalt blue, but then underglazed, I'm sorry, then overglazed color has been applied where areas have been left to fill in with additional colors over the, over, over the, this, this pattern. And you can see this um, very clearly in this enlarged detail. This um, technique um, required that the additional colors were fixed at a low temperature firing that took place after the original fi uh, firing with the cobalt blue. Um, the technique, which may be translated as joined colors, first emerged during the Xuanda era but was perfected during the Chenghua era when this cup was made. And the Chenghua era, um, uh, the porcelain, um, the finest porcelain uh, of, of the Ming dynasty was, was produced during this time. And the, the material and the, um, the thickness of the porcelain um, is, is so fine that when you hold this cup up to the light, you can see the pattern through the walls of the porcelain. This Yongzhen era dish is painted on both front and back with a design of peach tree branches bearing blossoms and eight fully formed fruit, as well as five bats. These elements are filled with messages for good fortune. The, the sophisticated opaque overglazed enamel colors used in this design include pale shades of green and pink, um, very subtle, um, very subtle, uh, just, um, variations of, of these shades, um, which is a hallmark of this, this era. The pink comes from colloidal gold in a high lead enamel base, and many scholars believe that the technology used to produce it came from the West, where it was used earlier to produce pink enamels on metal objects. But we also know that, that um, Chinese craftspeople and Western Jesuit specialists worked together in the imperial workshops during the Yongzhen era and we're busy formulating new kinds of technology. So this uh, may be a technology that um, uh, involved not only Western, but, but also um, Eastern adaptations. I'm now gonna show you a couple of the fabulous Korean works in the collection. <clears throat> 
this elegant uh, foliate bowl and saucer set um, sports the coveted Kingfisher blue glaze for which Gorio ceramics have been prized for centuries. The color is the result of the presence of iron oxide in the glaze, high fired in a reducing or a deoxidizing environment in the kiln. The 12th century Chinese elites who encountered these, these Korean wares were, as we are still today, dazzled by the beauty of the color. One of them, author Taiping Laoren, designated the, the glaze as, quote, first under heaven, unquote. And he said, quote, although potters of other areas in, imitate them, none of them can achieve the same qualities, unquote. Um, this, this, there are two of these from this set um, that are on, on view in the exhibition. And um, not only is the glaze incredibly beautiful, but also these, um, these lotus-shaped forms of the saucer and, and bowls um, are, are, are just um, breathtaking. During Korea's Joseon dynasty from 1392 to 1910, um, as taste shifted in tandem with the rise of Confucianism, underglazed blue porcelains became among royal uh, became, became very popular among royalty and Confucian elites. This charmingly decorated example features symbols of longevity, including pine tree, crane, and longevity-inducing fungus, uh, and the moon. The combination on a Korean porcelain that is underglazed blue and a storage jar is very rare. And in fact, no other examples of the type are known. Um, so this is a, a large and really um, beautifully uh, painted example. And the quality of the, the blue and white painting has a kind of playfulness that is um, really indicative of, um, of Korean taste. Um, let's move on now to some South and Southeast Asian uh, works. The development of South and Southeast Asian art collecting in America bears a direct relationship to the awareness of these parts of Asia resulting from the U.S. involvement in World War II and to the international conflicts and tensions that followed in the regions. JDR III and Blanchett's collecting of South and Southeast Asian art and of the Himalayas also coincided with an increased attention to the art of these regions by European and American dealers and private, and private collectors in the 1960s. JDR III's focus on collecting and promoting of the, the art of these areas, as well as his involvement in helping to solve their profound problems related to population growth and agricultural development in the early 1950s and 60s. Um, and also very much grew out of his concerns about the Cold War and his awareness that communist, communism could pose a threat to the governments of those countries. Franz Castors created the standing East Indian Buddha image that you're seeing here in front of you using the lost wax technique when the Gupta style of North and Northeastern India was peaking during the sixth century. The iconic Gupta period, fourth to sixth century style is present in the face of the Buddha where it can be discerned in the sensuous full lips, heavy lidded eyes and oval face with the relatively hair, uh, high hairline. Um, and this is a Buddha that uh, includes the various distinguishing uh, signs that most Buddha's images have, like the elongated earlobes and the bump on the top of the head known as the Ushanisha. And something that is specific to this sculpture that one does not always see or rarely sees is um, that the fingers appear to be webbed, which is indeed one of the signs of the Buddha. But um, we're not sure in this case whether um, the, the casters intentionally um, web the figure fingers or whether that's just the result of um, kind of a, a, a flaw in the, in the casting. Um, and yet um, it's actually one of my favorite uh, features of this, this beautiful sculpture. 
Buddhism flourished in East India between the 8th and 12th century. Um, when the artisans uh, carved the image of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni as a universal ruler that you see here on the left. The carving shows the attention to decorative detail and beautifully proportioned and modeled uh, figurative features for which Pala art is celebrating, celebrated. Famous monasteries in Bihar, in the region where the sculpture was made, attracted monks from across Buddhist Asia who longed to study in this great center of learning and the style um, had international influence. Um, you, you can see um, the, there are beautiful, um, um, dense um, details to, to this carving. And they can also uh, be seen on the one to the right-hand side, um, which is an image of the most popular bodhisattva, a Buddhist being who postpones enlightenment to help others on their own path to enlightenment. Um, this uh, this uh, bodhisattva is called Avalokiteshvara and is the personification of universal compassion. Uh, but uh, Avalokiteshvara is invoked to help those in, needs, in need and um, appears in numerous forms. The Kasarpana or sky gliding Lokeshvara manifest, manifestation of Avalokiteshvara that this sculpture represents is youthful, has two arms, wears his hot hair high uh, in a mat, matted style and is an aesthetic. Um, and you can see uh, here is is seated um, with one leg with one leg pendant. This magnificent icon is of the Hindu god Shiva who performs the dance of bliss. Shiva holds a drum which symbolizes the rhythm of creation and fire, the destructive force of the universe. His open right palm signifies protection and his left, left hand points to, to his raised foot signifying refuge and deliverance. The demon of ignorance and illusion lies prostrate, vanquished below him. You can see he's standing on that demon. <clears throat> this figure um, is an example of uh, these beautiful uh, solid cast Chola period bronzes that are in fact um, considered masterworks of bronze casting globally. These are among the most um, sophisticated and beautiful bronze works cast ever in the, in the, in the entire world. And this is another example of one that um, is really endearing and also one of my personal favorites. Um, it is of Ganesha, the elephant, the elephant headed god and son of the Hindu god Shiva and his consort Uma or Par uh, Parvati. He's the deity of auspicious beginnings and is also worshiped as god of good luck and remover of obstacles. The mace in his back hand and the lasso in his, in, in his back, uh, I'm sorry, the base in his, his back right hand and the lasso in his back left symbolize his position as god of war and his ability to ensnare a devotee. He also holds a broken tusk in his right, his front right hand. These attributes relate to his role as a door guardian, guardian who helps maintain ritual purity and protection from malevolent forces. Chabi Ganesha also has a fondness of sweets. And here he picks one up out of his left front hand with his trunk. And I should add here that um, Chola bronzes are so beautifully cast uh, in three dimensions that I uh, highly encourage you when you see this in real life, that you make sure that you uh, look at them from all possible angles because they are just exquisite in the way that um, they are cast and the way that the physical bodies are rendered or the sense of physical bodies are rendered. 
This elegant sculpture comes from Kashmir, an important crossroads between North India and parts of Central Asia, China, and Tibet. It was created during the second quarter of the Karakota dynasty when the empire expanded and there was a surge in production of architecture, sculpture, and painting. The Buddha's broad almond-shaped eyes are typical of the region. He wears an elaborate beaded five-point crown and a three-pointed cape that covers his shoulders and chest. The Buddha positions his hands in a gesture of turning the wheel of the law or preaching. This central figure is seated on a lotus pedestal that has emerged from a pond and an image of the sun and crescent moon tops each, each stupa, respectively representing wisdom and compassion. And of course the lotus is a symbol of, of purity because it emerges from uh, muddy waters, um, beautiful and pure. The sculpture also has a significant Sanskrit inscription at the bottom of the base that both identifies the donor and the date of the sculpture to the first half of the eighth century. The donor, the Princess Devashri, was likely the daughter of King Nandivik Ramaditya Nandi. So not only is this a beautiful uh, piece, but it is also dated and connected with, with royalty. The masterful artists of Nawari descent have traditionally been responsible for creating the religious art of Nepal. And this sculpture is cast with locally, the locally mined copper they used. They then embellished it with gilding. Here we see, uh, and this is the work on the left, here we see the late 13th or early 14th century Bodhisattva of Compassion grasping a lotus in his left hand and with his right hand in the gesture of charity. The impact of North India's fourth through sixth century Gupta style, which I discussed in a beautiful Indian sculpture from the collection earlier, is still present despite the centuries that have passed in the smooth torso, broad shoulders, long legs, um, that are all revealed through clinging, the clinging cloth um, of the drapery on this uh, bodhisattva. The broad face, full cheekbones, elegantly raised eyebrows above wide set eyes, however, are clearly in Nepalese. And then on the right hand side, um, we have another example of a bodhisattva. More than two centuries before the creation of this sculpture, from Western Tibet, Buddhism had become the state religion of Tibet. The transmission of, of some stylistic uh, characteristics from Kashmir are present in the sculpture. And this is not surprising because the interaction, there was interaction between Tibet and Kashmir. The Bodhisattva's powerful torso and exaggerated waistline relate to the Kashmiri, the Kashmiri tradition as do the figure's broad eyes, arched eyebrows, and facial shape. The stance of the figure with his legs solidly apart and the long garland of flowers that encircles him are characteristic of images made in parts of Western Tibet. The 11th century in Cambodia to which this elegant figure dates was a time of great temple construction. Even despite the missing head and arms. It is no wonder that the Rockefellers were drawn to the sculpture. It's a classic example of the style associated with Bafuan, the cosmic mountain-shaped Angkor period temple. This image seems to be abstract and also to radiate life. Simple lines indicate a sarong wrapped around the figure's lower body and tied at the front of the waist. At her hips, extra cloth falls down the front of the garment ending in a stylized fishtail. Unlike John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Abby Aldrich Rockefeller and other great American collectors of Asian art, John D. Rockefeller III and Blanchett Hooker Rockefeller were motivated, were motivated by goals that extended beyond a special attention to particular artworks and a desire for status. Yes, they collected 
examples of Asian art that, quote, stirred and lifted them, unquote. But more importantly, they hoped that the spectacular works they chose would have a direct impact on how Americans viewed and understood Asian nations and cultures. I end this talk as I began it, sharing J.D.R. III's own words with you. Upon offering his collection to Asia Society in 1974, he described the act as, quote, a source of much pleasure and satisfaction to me, unquote. Stating further, quote, I say this because of my warm feelings towards the people of Asia and their great cultures, because I believe that further developments in Asia will be an important factor in the future of our country and the rest of the world, because I believe that Asia society has an ever increasing opportunity as well as responsibility to contribute important to United States Asian understanding and cooperation. And I'd like to feel that having the collection at Asia society can be a factor and a force to help in carrying out this opportunity and responsibility, unquote. Thank you. <laughs>